Hello, I'm Morris Kohansky, Wilderness Living Skills and Survival Instructor specializing in the boreal forest. And when I say the boreal forest, we're talking about an environment that has a great amount of firewood in it as compared to almost any other type of uh, ecology. So basically it's a part of the world where it can get very cold in the winter and you may depend on fires to keep you warm. And if you're going to depend on fires to keep you warm, then maybe you have to have the tools to extract the fuel, which may involve a saw and an ax or a combination of the two, but we're going to focus on saws for the time being. And there are other situations where we have talked about uh, uh, axes and saws, but this will be a kind of a, uh, uh, analysis. Now to me, the first and foremost, most important, bring it up first, is the saw that collapses into the smallest possible package. Well here we've got a saw that I saw this described in popular mechanics probably in the 60s or, or thereabouts or earlier and somebody makes these. I understand he's a, old, he's a pilot he's using new channels and the saw is encased in the frame and the frame converts into a usable form and in moments you have taken the the storage mode or the transport mode and here with a cantilever you are ready to use. Now to me a survival saw is one that will fell a hug size tree. A hug size tree will look something like that. So the saw must cut almost halfway through a hug size tree. In order to do that the blade's got to be about from your nose to your fingertip long and the distance between the blade and the back of the saw is close to at least the outstretched hand or more. This comes very close. Now the maker here says that this size of saw doesn't saw well because it seems too big. And the kind that's probably about this big is what he sells the most of. And I'm saying, well, that doesn't fulfill the definition of a survival saw so much. So he made me one of these. And of course you can see that uh, something like this can be homemade if you have access to this type of channel. But what I'm looking at here is about as good as it gets from my perspective with regard to a folding saw. Now you can go into a different direction and carry a, a saw. Here we've got a saw that I played around with which is obviously a band saw. Coils up very readily into a very small um, package and you can make a, sweet, uh, a frame saw with this blade that cuts remarkably well. There's twice as much blade as is needed and the ends are not really made. It's just a piece that I got recently because you've got to look far and wide to find the teeth of a bandsaw that cuts almost like a sweet saw and yet is this narrow, this flexible and this stowable. There is an attempt by people in the, in the, in the kit making business to, uh, to include a compact saw and one form is this which is very um, light and not really that functional in the whole issue in that this will cut through bone or something but it sure won't buck up the firewood. Fine, it's a saw. Just because you figure it's a saw and you include it in the kit you don't go very far with something like this in the boreal forest. Uh, a matter of fact here we have a very very uh, complex wire. It looks like a miniature form of barbed wire that's designed to cut through dry wood the fastest. This is a wire with a spiral cut right from one end to the other, very inexpensive, very much in, in, the, in the line of the type of saw the doctors use to saw through a bone and whatever. It's called a giggly when you use it that way. And so there are some pretty high-tech materials out there and probably the epitome as far as regular saws is concerned is the saw with a 48 inch blade. And you can see this stored, this could kill me if I don't take it out properly, stored in here. And the ideal way to carry this type of saw blade is in a belt around your waist. And this is 48 inches, which to me would be the Rolls Royce of saws for cutting up firewood. The objective that I set for the use of the uh, buck saw 
is that Ken had cut hug-sized logs because with hug-sized logs they build the king of fires. And the king of fires is either two or three logs hug-sized and the logs are as long as your outstretched hands and you build a fire between the logs by bedding one log down and then preparing it so that when you put the second log over it you can ignite it and it'll burn very slowly you might say for, for half the day or longer. But uh, I do not have the belts. Uh, it's a long story how I managed not to be able to keep a hold of them um, in which you would carry your blade around your waist. It's a gimmick that I thoroughly accept because it's so easy to stow these blades in a belt. And it's so important to have a tool that will help you meet your firewood needs as easily and as, as quickly as possible. Now here we have a frame where you take your blade. The maker of this one didn't leave very much space, but a learner, and you can see how crudely it's made in a way. This is, uh, uh, you know, uh, I don't seem to keep these very well. I would disavow having anything to do with such a roughly made saw, but nonetheless, you get the idea. You should be able to build a frame for your saw in 15 minutes or so. If there's wood to cut, there'll be materials for you to make your saw. You have to learn about how you tension it. You have to learn about the triangles that are incorporated for rigidity. And recently we have come with triangles made with string. So you need only one stick, but you set up and create two triangles by the way you twist here. But when we're talking about a saw that's in your belt and you convert it into a frame that will help cut through wood, this is what you're looking at, is learning how to take sticks that are readily available and convert them into a, a portable saw. We have here a video that uh, I've been out for some time and in there you'll see a meticulously carefully crafted buck saw in this sense with regard to the, um, um, you, know, you know, the expertise that develops as you make many of them. Probably you make about a dozen of those before you get very skilled at making them within that 15 minutes that I suggest. There are other folding saws. There's this one that uh, you can see that there's an attempt without the use of uh, aluminum channel, whatever, that you've got an ingenious way of making a compact fold foldable saw. There are others that you may encounter which would be almost works of art. So your saw blade is encased and generally the rule is do you get a lot of space between the, the, uh, uh, the blade now in this case, we have somebody has knotted these ends together. Some student has been uh, working with the saw. And as a result, I find things this knot here is foreign to me. Someone else put it in there because I leave these in the hands of students. And they sometimes attempt to do things. And then I pick up my saw and I wonder what's going on. Well, here, I think you've got the facility. This cord keeps everything together. And this cord will then gets used up and tensioned. Because many saws depend on this business of the parbuckling, as it's called, where you take and twist a little. And you keep doing this until the blade is as tight as you may care to have it. each time you put it together. So when you can start throwing rocks with this little piece of wood here, your, your blade will be as tight as you want it. When you're using cord here, it better not be elastic. And if it's slightly elastic, doing this is kind of dangerous because things break at the far end and they come flying towards your face, knocking teeth out and blind, or knocking eyes out and so on. But that's another version of a collapsible saw. Of course, you're carrying the bulk of the frame rather than packing the blades and uh, then uh, finding the rest of the saw in the natural environment. Now that sort of covers the, the type of saw that has its place in a survival kit with, with regard to getting enough firewood to keep you happy. Keeping in mind that perhaps ordinary wood that maybe ranges from wrist thick to, to leg thick 
And it's going to be a prodigiously big pile. And I would say that you can choose almost any vehicle. The logs are going to be as long as the vehicle is wide and the pile about as big as the side view of the vehicle. If it's 60 below, every 24 hours you may consume that much firewood. Now if you uh, hear that in disbelief, live by your own rules and get by by your own rules. Personally, I would carry more sleeping bag and do less work with a, with a buck saw. The remaining saws here are kind of curiosities. Here is one that is of origin of, I would say, the World War, uh, World War I or World War II, uh, uh, a folding saw, actually put out by a reputable sawmaker called Disson, D-I-S-S-O-N, and it's, uh, it looks like a vicious bear trap. And you've got the, the, these, the, the whole idea is that it coils up into a small package and you, when you take it out of the package, you can make it into a serious cutting tool. Well, this is designed to cut in, this way. And you have handles in here that double up as the sharpening tool. So you've got the handle. And this would suffice a good healthy soldier could cut down a power pole with this in a rel relatively short time using something that packs away to very little. In the maintenance of the teeth and so on, you have a file that fits in the handle and we will sort of realize that this type of triangular file is used to sharpen all the saw blades provided that the teeth have not been hardened. Here we have the teeth are black and hardened. Usually a normal file will not touch them. So when you buy the blade, you use it for 20 hours or so and when the blade gets dull you usually buy another one so the blades normal blades are, are probably less than ten dollars and this is the file that keeps the the saw sharp this is the tool that bends the teeth so this would be called a saw set and we have the groove that goes in here and you have to have quite a wide uh, curve as it's called that's usually three times uh, wider than the blade itself so the blade can move smoothly in the curve. For the other saws you've got a device like this that becomes part of the maintenance chore. This is my father's tool I inherited from him for, for uh, setting the teeth that is every alternate tooth is bent one is bent one way the other is bent the other and this is the device that does it. This is what sharpens it the sharp in a more primitive sense this tool and this tool are essentially doing the same thing but you do this by eye. This is set so that when you clamp it down to the fullest extent it bends the tooth and, and that's it. And for different purposes you've got settings here that allow you to bend the teeth more or less depending on the kind of saw you're using. So we have this kit that makes the, uh, the person who's engaged in this type of activity um, independent. The, this is quite a collector's item. I am very fortunate to have all the components, which uh, I've seen other kits where some of the components are missing, and we won't put that back just yet because we've got other things to talk about. Here is an equivalent that fits in a snuff box size. And it actually would be very good if you could uh, put it in a, in a frame. This is what we mean here. But it's meant to be used that, that uh, method where without any frame and the teeth are arranged so that's the only way you can use it. But for stowage and compactness if this blade was long enough and if the teeth were made so that you could use it like that instead of like this then you would have an astounding piece of so-called survival equipment because it would compact be so compact because there's the rings and things that you put a wooden, your own handles in there in order to be able to use it. But business of cutting through trees in that back and forth motion using this system, you don't cut very much. You're not going to meet your firewood needs in the boreal forest, at least from my perspective, you can't. Now we come into other variations. Some kits where you're in snow country, you can get this type of saw with sweet saw teeth. And it's a little heavier, a little bulkier to transport, but you have the tool that cuts snow blocks for building igloos. And I actually found that some people seem to uh, 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 develop a more skillful use of this type of saw 
very quickly compared to even the bow saw. And this in many ways is actually quite a bit more indestructible. But in some cases it'll cut fairly sizable wood, but it also cuts you snow blocks. This is a saw that I use, it comes from the limbing section. So we have a whole series like this. This has a peculiar tooth in that it's actually meant to be used on the pull stroke. Uh, many saws that have very thin blades are used that way. But it's uh, something that has been around in my, in my uh, crafting situation. So about here, you're carrying certain sizes of uh, saw in order, for example, building a buck saw like this. If I have a little saw, and so when I say little saw, I have often broken this type of saw. And when I break the blade in half, I cut the handle off accordingly, and it's remarkably useful in an, as an adjunct to your knife in building stuff like this. Because here, cutting these sort of squared ends and so on, wherever you do lots of things, it is quite possible with a knife, a knife in a skilled, in the hands of a skilled person, it works well enough. <coughs> but if you got something like this, <coughs> it speeds up things, and there's a gazillion things, traps, deadfalls, and snares, where a small saw works. But generally, if you pare everything down to the bare minimum, you've got a sweet saw blade around your waist and you're doing everything with your knife. So here are the different kinds uh, that are available, which uh, I'm quite partial to. This probably in Sweden, in the Swedish army, this is packed in their kits for the tool to build tools sort of thing. Because there, when, when, when the small things are required, the small folding saw is more convenient to use and is easy to stow. But remember, it could be half the size and, and still be remarkably effective. This is here by the fact of its inexpensive nature in the dollars in the Dollarama. I think you can buy a saw like this for for the such a low price, like probably three dollars or whatever. Crafting. Crafting again. You may go even go so far as these I have used these a great deal where it's a box cutter in one side and it's uh, uh, so when I want a saw, this is a very thin blade where you got to cut by the pull stroke, otherwise you immediately twist the blade, not very useful, but it stows in the handle and the other, if you can use box cutter blades for whatever, and then there's on top of that a tape measure so you can measure everything for whatever. A universal tool that would be in the gulf compartment of a car. Now with every saw, the next thought is if I pinch my blade and I want to build wedges because with the saw you fell trees and you use wedges to help you fell them in the direction, a small axe and perhaps even smaller than this, but I don't want, don't like them to get them too small. So a little hatchet with a kind of a heavy head and there are so many things that I can do with that that, uh, that uh, Again, it adds a great deal of spice to your existence when you're surviving. And here we have a sheath. Many of these saws don't come with sheaths, or they come with awkward sheaths. And of course, you can build them out of birch bark or other sort of things. So you can learn how to build sheaths to accommodate any type of saw. Well, anyway, you will find that if you have uh, 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 an approach that requires a big fire, I think you find that a appropriate saw is indispensable. And the one extreme is for felling and sectioning large diameters of wood. On the other extreme, it's a saw that might be used for helping you construct the other tools that you require in survival. And when we have a saw like this, we're talking the buck saw, the Roycroft pack frame, the ski shoes, the, um, the uh, crutches. You name all these sort of things. A little saw like this makes life so much livable, but an, an, uh, an expert could get by with the knife here, but they're gonna, you're gonna take that much longer to be able to accomplish things. Combine a good saw blade like this one, or even this one with this hatchet, and of all I know, you might choose to build a cabin or a log house in the middle of nowhere because you've got the tools with which you can make the things that allow you to get by when you didn't bring your sleeping bag.